Uh, well, Calvin, thank you so much for joining me here today on the highest level. And, you know, we've known each other going back to your college days. I'm excited to chat with you. Um, and, and here you've had a 10 year plus NFL career. Uh, and we're here in May 2022. And I just want to know, uh, to start us off, what do you do in the off season? And, and what are you up to right now before the season starts? What do I not do during the off season? Uh, I mean, I try to knock out, I try to, what everybody does in a year, I try to do in like a three or four month um, clip, honestly. Uh, so everything that I would, every conference that I wasn't able to attend, you know, while the season was going on, I'm trying to attend conferences. I'm trying to meet people. I'm trying to have small touch points in different places in the country. And now since COVID is uh, behind us just a tad bit, every, every, you know, continent at this point, you know, there's business everywhere, whether it's business in a sport, of football or or business of sport in general and then taking the time to learn and I think when you you're, you're willing to be curious and you're willing to learn that'll take you a lot of different places and I've been blessed to, to to go a lot of different places just based on me being curious it's taking me to some bad places and it's taking me to some some really good places uh but I, I'm really thankful and grateful that God has blessed me to have just that sense of curiosity and, and, and willingness to, to take rejection and, and, and willingness to go in places that I'm not supposed to be um, and ultimately achieve that highest level. Um, not to plug the highest level, but that is, uh, is something that, you know, I, I grew up in my college years learning about and hearing about uh, on, on a consistent basis and on, on a daily basis. And it's, it's funny, man, that, that I now execute on all those principles that I learned about in college in a very uh, creative way that I, that I'm, proud of that I'm uh, uh the journey that has taken me on really excited for it and, and know that this is just the beginning I love hearing that and you, you mentioned continuing to learn and continuing to grow in the offseason even though a lot of people probably look at you and you're a successful investor you've given back a ton to the community and, and here you are in the midst still of a very successful NFL career and you're still striving to learn and get better talk about your ongoing skill and technique development uh what are you focused on this offseason in particular does it have to do more with investing uh on the business side or does it have to do more with football or, or is it always more holistic uh when, when you're well, thinking about the thing improvement? Is this yeah, football is always at the forefront. Ongoing skill and technique development, that is always happening on the football front. So that has been happening the minute the season ended. So that is something that is interwoven, integrated, always a part of life. I was actually pushing my green machine this morning, that, that, that green Tahoe that I showed up to, to SMU in a, a number of years ago. Uh, and that was part of the, the workout today. Um, but that process of ongoing skill and technique development within football is always happening. One of the, the, the big challenges that I took on this year was I wanted to learn how to code and I'm actually failing in that particular regard. Um, you know, that was a, 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 a goal of mine in 2021 to learn how to code. Um, and I had like a, a number of them. It was, it was taking this board readiness program. It was uh, taking place in the, well, taking part in the HBS crossover to business program there at Harvard. I knocked those both out. The other one was learning how to code and the other one after that, so four, four was, was learning how to play chess. Those last two have been a struggle. Um, this year I took on coding and I'm getting my butt whooped, brother. Uh, I ain't gonna lie to you. I have gotten my butt whooped. It has made my head hurt. Uh, and I actually sat down and the travel didn't help at all. Um, you know, I think that's something that I may have to do during the season because my schedule is a little bit more structured. But um, it was hard, man. It's still hard. And I, I, I told my product manager and told the woman that, that I had that, that helped me go through this self-paced uh, version of Cody, I'm struggling. I, I really am. I'm, I'm struggling uh, with just, you know, just, just some of the basic things that you need to learn how to code. And, and, and a couple of people be like, you know, why do you need to learn how to code? You know, you're an investor. You know, you don't have to know all the, all the gritty, the nitty gritty. And I'm like, well, I want to. Um, not for uh, investing purposes, but, but to challenge myself and push myself in a way that I feel I need to be pushed um, right now. And it has been, uh, I've fallen flat on my face in this regard. And I'm, I'm not afraid to say it has been a, a humbling experience and one that I'm not quitting on right now, but I'm going to pause and make sure that I give some more dedicated attention to it here in the new future. Yeah, and, and always so good, even if we're attaining the highest level in something that we're doing to challenge ourselves in other ways. And I think also it probably adds a little bit of perspective 
here you are kind of at the pinnacle of your career. You've had all of this success, but yet you step into that coding world and you're, you're right back to being a, a freshman going through uh, your red shirt year all over again. So uh, well, I, I think it does give you a little good perspective kind of heading into yet another NFL season. Well, the thing is I had a mentor of mine that said, Kelvin, it is very, very hard to go from mountaintop to mountaintop. And mountaintop being, you know, in the National Football League for a number of years, played a lot of football, got a lot of miles on the body, and going from mountaintop over here to mountaintop in business, coding, uh, uh, another entrepreneurial uh, activity, it's very hard. I mean, you think about it, you know, if somebody says, wakes up and says, hey, I want to be a professional football player today, that is very hard to be a CEO of a Fortune 500 company and say, hey, I want to be a professional football player today and actually go and be a professional football player. And I think we as football players think that, hey, I'm a professional football player, or I can go be a Fortune 500 CEO. It's, it's not that easy. So it's hard to go from mountaintop to mountaintop. And, and now I'm not saying it can be done, but it is a lot better when you go back down the mountain, start back over in the valley and work your way back up. And right now in some areas of my life, I'm going back to the valley and kind of working my way back up in, in a couple of different industries. Yeah. And the greats are always the best at the fundamentals. Uh, and, and you and I had a conversation here a couple of uh, weeks ago, and you told me uh, to fall in love with the mundane all over because, again. And yes. uh, I, I think that's uh, exactly what I'm hearing with you uh, entering coding, chess, all these new adventures uh, mm -hmm. that you're getting into. Um, and, and it's all the same principles. Uh, yeah. It's just a different highway, uh, but the same principles. So I love hearing that. And, you know, a lot of what we're talking about, I think, leads into this next question, which is, you know, here you are a decade plus in the NFL, and you're what some might consider an undersized NFL tackle. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think I would say that, right? Um, even having known you and coached you during your college years, but yet here you are and you've had so much success. And I just want to hear from you, like, what do you attribute that success to, even though you don't have the quote unquote measurables that most people look for? I think first and foremost, it's the grace of God that I have to start there. Uh, my faith has played a, a very, very integral role uh, in the success of, of my career. Uh, secondly, um, I would attribute to the people that I've been associated with, the people that I've had a chance to, to spend time with, the people that I've been coached by, um, people who I've been recruited by. I think that those people serve a, a very, very huge role and play a huge role in my life. Um, the things that they spoke into my life and the experiences that they shared and the experiences that they shed light on about their careers and how it could impact my career. Those things were, were, were super important to me growing up um, there in, in high school and college and even into the pros. Um, and then I think I've had a, a lot of people in my life kind of show me what the blueprint looks like. And I am one of those people that is, is, is obsessed with execution. If you show me or you tell me what you want to accomplish, what you want to do, and how you want to do it, I can go and do just that. Uh, I had a dad that worked on cars, uh, you know, and still works on cars. And it's very, in, in that vein, it's all about execution. You know what you have, you know the, the, the process, you know um, what the plan is. And his thing is, is, hey, here's the plan. I want you to take uh, the tar converter off this way. I want you to pull these boats out of this transmission. Uh, I want you to take the, the lug nuts off this way. I want you to take the brakes off this way. It's a process. So I understand the process. And when you give me that process and you give me what it looks like, I can go and execute on that. And I think, you know, those three things have been integral uh, into my career. Um, I'm all about, you know, I would say the last thing is, is preventative maintenance. Uh, I am all about how do you prevent your body from being in a place um, of discomfort, of hurt before it even gets there. Um, that's from training on a consistent basis. That's from staying active on a consistent basis. It's so funny, man. I, I have, I've been wearing Whoop for a number of years. And one of the founders that I backed uh, was talking on Twitter about, you know, his, his, uh, his, his numbers that he's been having, um, his recovery numbers. And he was like, man, my HRV uh, was down to 40 and Kelvin laughed me out the room. And, you know, he was like, well, what's, what's the highest HRV you've had? And I sent him like a screenshot of my, um, of kind of what, what I do and how I do it. And, and, and he saw, man, your wrist and heart rate is 50. How many words your wrist and heart rate is 50? But it's, it's a body that stays in motion. If it's a body that stays in motion, it's always in motion. A body that's at rest will stay at rest. 
And I would say that has been something that has been super helpful in my career is even when I'm not working out. And this week I haven't worked out, just came back from, from out of the country, giving the body a chance to kind of recover. I'm not as young as I used to be and, 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 and not as spry as I used to be. So I have to realize how to take care of the body the right way. Um, but with that, you know, I still walk every single morning. Every morning I'm, I'm out of the house about five o'clock, knocking out an hour of walking. At the end of the night after dinner, uh, by 6.30 to 7 o'clock, go for another walk. So it's one of those things where I've, I've maintained that level of consistency and that level of dis discipline uh, throughout my career that I think has helped um, execute on the plans and the blueprints that so many people have given me. Yeah, I love so much of what you just mentioned right there. Number one, the people. And I, and I think that's an under... Uh, uh, under talked about piece is, is when we look at people that have great success, oftentimes they have a great team around them, even in the great individual performers that we see. Uh, it's just not Tom Brady out there. Yes, he makes a lot of those plays on his own, but there is a whole team behind him supporting him, as I know you have as well. And another thing I really love is you talked about being process driven and not results oriented. We know being in the high performance business that like results matter. That's just like the bottom line. We understand that. But the teams that focus and the people that focus on just the results oftentimes don't get those results. And right. it's the people that are able to reverse engineer the results they want uh, that end up creating the processes that lead to their success. And you talked about people showing you the blueprint and, you know, you've become somewhat of a leader in the locker rooms, especially if, as you've matured and grown in your NFL career. And I just want to hear from you, like, who showed you the way in the NFL? Who taught you leadership at the NFL level? Yeah. You know, I think I had, I had the ability to be able to see leadership in a number of different ways, um, especially early on in my career when I got into that, that Pittsburgh uh, Steeler locker room. So you got to see it from, from Ben Roethlisberger. You got to see it from... Uh, Heath Miller, who was a tight end. You got to see it from James Harrison and Troy Palomalu. Uh, you got to see it from Brett, Brett Kiesel. Um, you know, you got to see it from, from uh, Max Starks and Willie Colon. Uh, you got to see it from Will Allen and Ryan Mundy. Um, you got to see it from a number of different ways. And you saw how even within organizationally, there was leadership with and, um, and uh, um, But you also got to see what it looked like from the player standpoint, you have to sit at every level, the ownership level, the management level, the player level, uh, within the weight room, uh, within uh, the training room. So those pieces of leadership were, were super helpful as the transition started from 2012 up until 2014. And then you had people like Ramon Foster and Marquise Pouncey and David DeCastro that really started to take the banner from an offensive line standpoint. Cam Hayward, who I fought with every day in practice, who's one of my, my dear friends in the National Football League, who's really taking that leadership mantle and taking it to a, a completely different level. So I had great men around me that showed me how to lead other men. And, and people are always asked, well, who, what, what does leadership really look like within a football locker room? It's who can lead other men. That's really all it boils down to. It's not about inspiration. It's not about motivation. It's not about creating fear. It's about how do you get other grown men to follow you? Simple as that. I don't know. I don't care how you do it. You can be quiet. You can be loud. You can be chasty. You can be a snake. You can be, you know, a sheep. It doesn't matter. How do you get other men to follow you? And when you are able to do that at scale consistently, Year over year, you're gonna have a great, great locker room. Um, so for me, that 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 foundation of leadership was really developed there, uh, there in Pittsburgh, and was able to take some of those learnings and then, you know, go to Jacksonville, go to New York, and and then you know get to Arizona and, and see different levels of leadership. You know, being you know here when I got to Arizona, seeing how Larry Fitzgerald led, seeing how Corey Peters led, um, and it's different different philosophies. Um, and the thing is, I've seen it at every step, and and you know every step in the journey. You know, Paul plus Lesney uh, there in uh, in Jacksonville uh, when I was there. Jeremy Parnell, who was the, the right tackle when I was there in Jacksonville. Um, you know, even though we didn't have the success that we wanted to have on the football field, uh, learning about the process. Uh, with Gus Bradley uh, there in, uh, you know, there in Jacksonville and, and, and Ty Bowles, you know, I, I talk about coaches all the time. Ty Bowles and, and Mike Tomlin for me are leaders of men. They know how to lead men. 
Uh, and, and it's been amazing to see the, the, the progress and the success of those two coaches within the coaching realm uh, because they found a way to lead men and they have their own way uh, of being able to do it. So I've been blessed to see leadership in all different forms. Like I said, ownership, management, the locker room, uh, some of the adjacent services that, 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 that touch um, NFL players on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's always fascinating to be able to watch it and see it. Uh, and, you know, we both went through, uh, you know, a master's program with, with Charlotte Barner. So to understand organizational dynamics, organizational culture, silence within the organization, how you move, how organisms move, how things are interwoven throughout the culture, what the culture looks like. Why is the culture that way? How do you change the culture? All those different things I've been able to see from a real world experience every single day of my life since I was drafted in 2012. Man, what a uh, what a great insight into what it's like to be in a locker room. And, and you mentioned Coach Mike Tomlin and Coach Todd Bowles, two of the best that are doing it today and, and probably two of the best here in the, in the modern NFL history. Talk about their similarities and differences as leaders of men. You know, I think that both of them have a phenomenal tendency of being able to pull just the right thing from the right people to get the right result on game day. Um, Ty Bowl has, you know, uh, Coach, Coach Bowles has his way of silently being able to do it. And Mike Tomlin has his way of being a puppet master to publicly be able to do it. Um, and it's special to see how, how both of them were able to do it. Um, you know, what I really enjoyed about both of them is how they empowered the coaches around them. Um, and you saw that in, in how they communicated with coaches, how they communicated with players within different uh, uh, um, different uh, units within, you know, within, within the team. And I think that is what I found to be most refreshing um, and I, I find that to be why they're where they're at. You know, Todd has been a phenomenal defensive coordinator. He's been a great head coach. I don't think he got the best opportunity and the best framework to be able to do that and execute on that there in New York. But I think he's going to do a phenomenal job uh, there in Tampa because of how he's able to, one, lead men, how he's able to empower coaches, and then how he's able to get the best out of men at the right moments in time um, on Sundays and even during the week. Yeah, I, I, it's really interesting that you mentioned specifically empowering coaches, because I think that as I've kind of gone through my career and, and studied the, the best and, and also been a part of teams that weren't successful, like you mentioned, you know, there's one common theme that you see in the leaders, and it's this ability to eliminate their ego. Uh, and I think part of that is admitting mistakes and, and doing it publicly in front of the team when they screw up. But then there's this other piece where it's not always all about them. Yes, yeah. they have big contracts. Yes, they have, uh, you know, weekly shows on, on the radio and, and talking to the media basically every day. But there's this other piece where you can't do it by yourself. You know, we mentioned a couple of minutes ago about the people that surround you. Uh, and building a staff is a critical piece towards building these successful organizations and ultimately supporting a successful head coach. Yeah. It's super important, but if you can't empower the people around you, how do you get your message to be disseminated throughout the organization? How do you get the, the, the things that you want to change or the things that you want to fine tune within a culture? How do you get those things disseminated uh, throughout the organization? And I think all of that pertains to the people that you surround uh, yourself with, the people that you nurture and bring along with you on this journey. And then how do you make sure that they're equipped and they're almost thrust forward in a number of different ways to make sure that you've equipped them to now take the reins if you don't have the reins, you know. Uh, and I've seen that, again, in many different instances with Mike T and with Coach Bowles uh, in a number of different capacities, whether it was at a, as a head coach, as a defensive coordinator. Um, you know, I saw how uh, Coach T will, will work with the offensive line, even though he's the defensive coordinator. I would see how uh, Coach Todd Bowles will talk to the quarterbacks. I mean, even, even though that head coach to quarterback relationship is so important, the way in which he maneuvered um, how to be able to, to operate with a young quarterback and an older quarterback and Josh McCann and Sam Donald, um, I thought it was impeccable. Uh, yeah, I, I could sit here and talk about these two all day and, um, you know, really interesting experiences that you've had with both of them. I had the fortune to, to work with Coach Bowles as well when I was in Miami and uh, just a fantastic coach, obviously, but but also a great human being as well, which I think oftentimes gets overlooked, especially in sports. We only care about the results. We only care uh, about what the last season's record was and, and ultimately having significance and, and impact on the people around you is, is really what stands 
stands the test of time. Um, you know, you, you, you went into Pittsburgh and, you know, you were at SMU and you had the good fortune to be there during a turnaround. Um, this, the, the same time I was there where we got a chance to get acquainted with each other. And uh, you go into Pittsburgh as a late round draft pick. And uh, for the audience that's not aware, late round draft picks, you're not getting a ton of guaranteed money. You're not even really guaranteed a roster spot. So you're really from day one in a fight to, to get onto the team and, and hopefully make an impact in some way. You have a very unique circumstance. You were a late round draft pick and you came in almost right away. I don't want to say it was immediate, but like you came in. Uh, and you set a tone very early on that you were prepared for this. You might be slightly undersized. You may not have the measurables, but you were ready for this moment. So just kind of talk about those early, maybe a couple of months or a couple of years in Pittsburgh as you were developing as an NFL player and kind of solidifying yourself as somebody the team could count on. Yeah, I think a lot of that came from what I was taught in college, you know, um, and, and, you know, I mentioned the people that were around me, but, you know, you had people like June Jones that spoke into me. Uh, he said I was going to play, I was going to play in the National Football League for a long time. Uh, that is rain to be true. Uh, you had Dennis McKnight, who, who was my offensive line coach when I first, no, no, no. Ronnie Van Clark, who was my first offensive line coach when I got to, to, to SMU, uh, you know, who talked about the process. And I still stay in touch with Coach V. Um, Dennis McKnight, you know, who talked about, you know, you got to be like a dog on a bone, just gnawing at a bone, um, you know, that, that gave me a, a different mentality that I think boded well for when I got to the league. But I think the most impactful was, was Adrian Clem, uh, who said, nobody are, these are not your friends. Uh, and when I went to Pittsburgh, man, I, I found the, the biggest, I guess the biggest bully on the block, quote unquote, and uh, we fought. And at that time it was Cam Hayward. He was a young and upcoming, you know, uh, first round pick from the year prior. First, I think first or second round pick from a year prior. And I was just trying to make the team, man. Uh, and uh, in one-on-ones, I would that I would jump up and I'd go, go against the best. Um, and I went at it. And sometimes I won and sometimes I lost. I remember uh, one-on-ones, my, my rookie year, Mike T had me go like nine times in a row. Like one-on-ones, nine times in a row is not for, for the faint at heart. Uh, and... Uh, I did it and, and fought every single play uh, because that's what I felt was needed to show that I belonged. Um, and I never was the biggest. I'm still not the biggest, not even close to, to, to I mean, I feel, I'm probably still one of the smallest offensive linemen in the National Football League starting at, at, at tackle. Um, and I just realized that that was something that I, I had to prove and still have to prove on a daily basis. Um, and then I think technically I was – better technically than than some folks that were much stronger um much more experienced than I was and I think that technique as I con as I continued to get older served me well um and how I was able to manipulate uh force and pressure uh how I was able to stay in front of people how I was able to move people um and I think it helped from the experiences that I had in college the mental experiences that I had in college, the mental gymnastics that, that I had in college, uh, and the mental processes that I learned in college that helped bowl well for me in the National Football League. And I would have to say, I don't think that that many colleges get this experience, especially, you know, 20 years, 09 to, to, to 12, where you have pretty much the entire coaching staff that either played in the league or was very closely aligned with people that were in the league. You know, uh, and, you know, you look at that time period for SMU from, you know, uh, 07, 08 to the, the time June left. It was a lot of pro guys that came out of that particular program. Um, you know, some guys played, you know, played a good three or four years and, and had a really good career. So it's one of those things that I think we had the fortunate experience to be able to to, to be coached by people who knew what it took to not only get there, but stay there. And, and Coach Clem always would say this, Adrian would always say this, man, anybody can get to the National Football League, but can you stay there? And I think that was something that has stuck with me the entire time is, is even now, you know, I can get to training camp, but can I stay in training camp? Uh, can I perform? Can I perform under pressure? Can I perform when my body isn't feeling right? Can I perform at this age? And that's now the next battle, mental battle, is like, all right, well, you know they're trying to get you out of here. 
you know, you over 30. So it's like, well, what are you going to do to make sure that your body is in the best possible shape uh, to make sure that you're successful week in and week out? Yeah. And I can remember that time, you know, when you were a young player at SMU and, and just, you were right. We were surrounded by a lot of great coaches that had been there before and, and were kind of elevating that program up. I can remember, um, you know, coach Clem and I were close at that time and we would spend a lot of uh, our off season together, watching film, going to breakfast, talking about football, coming back, doing workouts, watching film. And you were always somebody that was there with us. And I can remember one day in particular, we knew that you love to watch film and, and kind of be around. And we were like, Kelvin, what are you doing? Like, it's summertime. Like, you know, go, go hang out with your friends. Go like see girls, go, <laughs> go on a trip. Uh, and, and you were very, very focused at that time. The most focused college player I've ever been around uh, in my 12 plus years coaching at the college and NFL level. And so I think a lot of people, it's easy to say, well, he's been in the league for a long time. He knows how to, how to get to training camp. He knows how to get through training camp. Uh, and, and I keep mentioning undersized, not as a detriment to you or your skill or your ability, uh, but more uh, out of respect um, and, and the tremendous admiration I have for you in, in the career that you've had. And you've always had that mentality of always continuing to get better, always continuing to challenge yourself. Uh, and, and I think that that's really cool that you were able to be at SMU during that time to kind of develop a, as a young man and obviously as a young player that would go on to play in the league. Talk, talk about what you remember during that time, because you were at SMU when they were kind of like at, at the bottom, a uh, couple back to back one in 11 seasons. Uh, and, and then we were able to kind of come out of that and, and have a Hawaii Bowl, big time Hawaii Bowl win, go to a couple of Hawaii Bowls or uh, go to a couple of bowl games. Just talk about what you remember about that time and, and being being with your teammates and, and just kind of the evolution of the culture in that program. Yeah, it's, it's crazy, man, you know, because I was I wanted to transfer out after that that first one in 11 season. Um, I had never knew what it was like to lose like that. And, you know, I you lost in high school, you lost some games, but I was in the playoffs and, you know, I always had a shot at, at winning a state championship or at least winning a district championship. So I, you know, I'm like, this is, this is beyond me. I don't know what one in 11 is like. And I was red shirt. And I was like, do I want to really be a part of this? Um, and, you know, my dad, I remember calling my dad. He was like, man, we don't quit. I don't know. What, I don't know what it is to quit, you know? I get up every morning, make sure you got food on the table, make sure your sibling got food on the table. I don't know what it is to quit. Um, so, you know, to stay there and experience the culture shift, even when June came in, we were 1-11 that year, 08. And even in being, oh, and, and, and even in 08, even being 1-11, you could tell that something was changing. You didn't know what it was, but it wasn't about who looked good, who uh, who got the ball, who had the ball, who was quarterbacking, um, who got the praise at the end of the game. It was all about winning. It was all about the process. And I think that, for me, was what, you know, ingrained in me what was most important to the team and what was most important to the culture. Um, and that's been something that, for me, has is, is, is guided the, the whole experience. And I think you had relationships that were formed that were super impactful. You know, you had the goon squad that was started uh, there in uh, 20, uh, 20, what, 2008, 2009. Um, and we all came in together. So it was, well, it was What's funny. the goon squad, Kelvin? To share with us. What's the goon squad? Man, the thing is, I'm, I don't messed up some of the names, man. But you had, um, uh, you had. Uh, you had Kelly Turner. You had Blake. Kelly, the so Kelly, Kelly Turner was my roommate. Uh, my, my roommate my entire time there at, at SMU. So Kelly Turner. Uh, was right guard. You had Bryce Tennyson and Blake McJunkin that, that rotated at center. Left guard, you had Ribeye, um, you know, uh, Xbox 360. You had uh, JT Brooks and Brian Collins who played at, uh, at, at right tackle. I cannot remember our names. I remember mine. I think it was a goonologist, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but the goon squad was just the offensive lineman, man. We had a great time with each other. Uh, came Like I said, all got came in together, stuff for Blake McJunkin and, and Brian Collins, but all came in together. Uh, as, as incoming freshmen and all left together as, as red shirt seniors. Um, so that's probably one of the most memorable experiences. And then I think just the process 
of what we went through, um, the process of what we went through and how we went through it, going through uh, two and 22 and then finding a way to, to turn it around. And I, I remember the game that actually clinched it for us. It was, it was us at home playing uh, the UTEP uh, minors, um, the UTEP minors that, that was the game that, that got us into the, the Hawaii Bowl. And, and for me, that has been something that has been uh, so impactful uh, to my career and so impactful to the people that I've gotten to spend time with over the years now. Uh, yeah, the, uh, you know, very special time in SMU's uh, in SMU's history. You know, having uh, you know some really high peaks uh, and kind of coming out of that lull that they had had for 25, 30 years there. Uh, and you talked about impact, and it's interesting because I did want to touch on something that you know almost in a way eclipses what you've been able to do on the field, and that's being recognized as a Walter Payton Man of the Year Award finalist. Uh, in, in two seasons, I believe, 2018 and this past season, 2021. And I just want to give you an opportunity to talk about a legacy of serving others and, and kind of where you got that from and, and just what that impact on others um, has meant for your career. You know, the thing is, is it, there, there was never a time where I felt that I needed to be recognized for wanting to be able to serve and help people. And at the end of the day, I, I've you know, I talked about, you know, kind of my upbringing, but it was my mother and my father that taught me how to serve. My grandfather who taught me how to serve, um, you know, serve people in the church. And then they went to serving people outside of the church. And then they went to college and it was serving people in and around SMU and around the SMU bubble that we, that, that's there in, in, in University Park and Highland Park. And then in Pittsburgh, it was serving North Side over in Pittsburgh. In Jacksonville, it was serving the North Side uh, there in Jacksonville. In New York, it was serving the New York area in the Harlem area while I was in New York. And now here in Arizona, it was about, it's, it's about serving the, the, the Roosevelt district and, and, and what they have going on in the Roosevelt district. So at the end of the day, it's all about serving where I am and where I'm at and being able to then go back and serve where I've come from. So being able to always pour into Mejia, always pour into Dallas, always pour into Pittsburgh, always pour into Jacksonville, always pour into to greater New York, and now always pouring into Arizona. And it's, Again, it's, it's just been this, this, this moment and this time that I feel that that is what I get energy from. I get energy from going to, to doing a volunteer uh, uh, distribution or, or a volunteering uh, um, packing for, for distribution. Um, I get energy from seeing young people learning how to code and young people learning what it's like to, to interact with a computer and what that process is like. It's, I get a lot of energy from going to a, a developing country and seeing what having access to water would do for a community. Uh, I get a ton of energy from that. And for me, it, it energizes me to want to do more. And then when I travel and I see the things that I see, I'm like, well, I need to put some resources here. I need to, to garner some support. Um, and being able to go to India, man, I, I mean, I saw some things in India that, you know, I just never knew existed. And I've been to some of the, 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 the parts of Africa that are very rough. But seeing some of those things there in India, I'm like, that, you know, World Vision, which is my global partner, you know, how, how can we do some things in India? So I think it's being able to see the need and then actually do something about it. Uh, and I've always said this, don't just talk about it, but be about it. Because everybody can see that there are issues and there are problems that are going on in our society. But what are we going to do to actually come back and find a solution for it? And for me, it's all about finding solutions. Um, you know, uh, don't attack the problem. I, what, what was what was what was what was that Gans? You're, you're not attacking the person. You're attacking the problem. There it is. You're not attacking the person. You're not. You're attacking the problem. I'm not talking about governments. I'm not talking about public sector. I'm not talking about private sector. But there is a problem, and I want to go. I want to go and attack that problem and find a solution for it. Yeah, I love that. And obviously, you know, you're not doing it for the recognition of the Walter Payton Award or anything like that. But I think it is. Uh, just kind of a, a, a symbolic gesture towards the significance that you've had on, on so many from Mejia, Texas, all across the world. So um, obviously, uh, just a wonderful legacy that you're leaving behind. And, you know, another part of your legacy uh, um, in combination with your philanthropy has been your business uh, acumen uh, that you've grown here over the last five, six years, and, and probably even previous to that. Um, just kind of share with us a little bit about kind of like where you're looking to be involved. I, I know you mentioned coding earlier, and I know STEM is an area that, that you are very passionate about. So just kind of talk about where you're involved in and, and kind of where that passion came from for business. Yeah, the thing is, man, I mentioned my dad earlier. So my grandfather taught my dad how to work on cars. My dad took it to, to, to Beecham 2.0 and, and turned it into a business, family-owned business. Uh, 
I took it to 3.0 and I, I'm just, just taking it to places that I don't think anybody thought was, 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 uh, was possible. Um, and I would say, and I, I, sorry about the noise in the back. That's my kids in the back. Hopefully they can, they can close that down just a little bit when you do does the audio. But, um, uh, you know, my, seeing my dad work, I was like, there has to be a more efficient way of doing this. It has to be a more, uh, business savvy way to be able to do this. And I was like, well, I'm gonna go to SMU and I'm gonna go to Cox School of Business. That didn't work out too well. Uh, again, failing and failing, you know, uh, failing forward. Um, I wasn't able to get into the Cox School of Business, but, but was able to get uh, into the, the, the education, I mean, the, the economic department. I got my master's, no, I got my, my major in economics and started to think about, you know, what, is, what does money look like? How does it flow? Where does it flow from? And then you've been around SMU, you see oil and gas, you see real estate, and you just start getting exposed to so many different things. And I think more than anything, the exposure is what drove the curiosity into some of these other businesses. Because as I left SMU, it was all about, well, okay, well, let me follow, let me follow the oil and gas industry. I followed the oil and gas industry. You have the Marcella Shell that's blowing up there in Pittsburgh. And then, you know, price per barrel plummets, you know, right around the time that I blew my knee out. And I'm like, all right, well, oil and gas may not be might not be the way. I was spending time with Chevron at the time. And I'm like, well, man, this might not be the way. So I thought about going to CMU and get my 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 uh, my MBA in in in, uh, um, in, uh, in business and had a mentor that was at AT and T. Um, it was like Kelvin. I don't think that's the best route for you. You know, let me let me teach you some things, and I think I, I I'll help you out quite a bit. So, you know, the Super Bowl happened in 2016, and um, I went out there and got to see what technology looked like and the growth of technology and how fast and how exponentially fast and the exponential wealth that was flowing through that particular industry. And man, it just took me by storm. It's, it's become an addiction. You know, went out there for an internship uh, to start out, went out there for another internship. And then every summer, every spring, I just go spend some time out there in San Francisco. I'll find somebody I can stay up, stay with and stay at their house and, and then go take meetings and have dinners at their house. And you know, go to other people's houses and then, you know, walk down Sand Hill Road where, where all the legacy and the legendary venture capitalist offices are. Um, and that just, that, that's, that, that compounding started to happen. Um, that lunyap that I was putting in, you know, that, that little extra was starting to, 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 to take, take place. And then I got to New York, man, and you think about New York, it's the Mecca. Everything is on steroids there in New York. Financial services, tech, art, design, anything that you want was there in New York. And that's, and I think that next moment was really, that was like, you know, rocket fuel, you know, there in New York. And then as I got to, New, to, to, to Arizona, it's been like this process of being able to strategize a lot more and utilize all these relationships and all the, you know, the connections that I've had over the years that, that have built up in, in, in every place that I've played in, in Mejia, in Dallas, New York, Jacksonville, um, uh, Pittsburgh, and how all those relationships kind of come into, come into form as you start to, to be in different ecosystems, as you start to be in, uh, in, different, in different boardrooms and different meetings, and how those things are just interconnected, because the business world is really small. But you have to make sure that you're a great person because uh, people don't want to mess with a-holes. They don't want to they don't want to spend time with a-holes. They ain't trying to lose money uh, and they want to be around people that they like. They want to do business with people that they like. And when you show yourself to be friendly and you're willing to, to give a little bit, uh, you'd be surprised what happens. And, I've, you know, we, we both know this saying all too well, what you give will grow, what you keep, you lose. And I've been somebody that I take pride in being able to give, not only financially, not only with my time, but with my resources. And it's really come back to me um, in, in ways, again, that I've never thought were, were imaginable. Yeah. An incredible example for any young athlete or, or really any, any young person looking to get into business or, or like you said, uh, have success in one area and, and fail in another on their, on their way to the next mountaintop. So love that you shared that. A uh, couple of quick questions for you to get you out of here on. Uh, you played offensive line in the NFL for uh, a decade plus now. Who's the best defensive lineman you've gone against? This guy, Junior Gallet. Um, not a lot of people know his name, but man, he gave me hell in 2014, my first year starting at left tackle. He took me to the woodshed. And, you know, he's not a, a, not a household name, but he was, uh, he was somebody that I had a lot of trouble with uh, playing for the New Orleans, New Orleans Saints at the time. Um, best defensive lineman that, 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 that I was. And I played some greats, Terrell Suggs, Debo, you know, James Harrison. 
Um, Cam Hayward, who I have a lot of respect for, Von Miller, you know, Mac, Aaron Donald, the whole nine. Uh, but Junior Gallep uh, was somebody that that, that 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 took me to the woodshed that day. We always have that one game that's like etched in our brain or or maybe like scarred in our brain that we just cannot get out Can't of there. So. Can't let it go. <laughs> um, what are some of the common traits on the best teams that you've been on? Culture, chemistry, and people actually care about one another. And when you actually have that, you, you, you have something very, very special where people actually care to see others succeed and they want to see others succeed. Yeah, it's always about the intangibles. Um, you know, the the best teams are never the most talented teams. They're always the teams with the most character and that can come together the best. Um, and uh, last question for you is uh, any books out there? I, I know that you're a, a big reader, um, whether it's in business or philanthropy or maybe even sports related, any books out there that you would recommend to the audience? Yeah, I got it. It's crazy. I got stacks of books everywhere. Um, but I'm actually loving this book right here. Uh, Never split the difference. Mm. Um, negotiation um, book about uh, one of the FBI's top hostage negotiators, uh, and just find books like that to be super, super interesting. You know, you know, as a as an athlete, I'm, I'm getting to that. Well, as an athlete and a, and a somebody that's aspiring to be an investor. You know, I'm starting to be in, in circles and, and, and that concept of negotiation is becoming such a huge thing. Um, but again, it goes back to the people. How do you treat people? How do you talk to people? How do you understand people? How do you read people? Um, and that's something that's really become a, a, a big deal in kind of how this process is going for me. And, and that book has been super helpful. Love that. Love that. Well, we'll have to get you a copy of Finding Intangibles uh, so we can put it there on your desk. Uh, so you can pull it out on uh, future uh, future podcast interviews. Kelvin, thank you so much for joining me here. It was a, a blast getting a chance to visit with you and reminisce a little bit. And, and thank you so much for joining me on the highest level. Yes, sir. Anytime.